when you when you produce something on mass um the the potential mine life on something of this scale is is large um and the demand that that's coming for nickel and cobalt it's the only asset that i can see anywhere of that kind of scale that can actually satisfy today we're diving into the story of aston minerals asx aso have just announced a maiden 1 billion ton nickel resource the scale of this is absolutely mind-blowing and more importantly it has the opportunity to play a critical role within strategic supply chains in north america we all know about the electric vehicle transition and how important key EV battery materials like nickel will be as well as graphite and lithium. And Aston Minerals are looking to play their role within the supply chain. We're very grateful to be joined by their executive chairman, Tolga Kumovo, on the channel today. Tolga, fantastic week for Aston Minerals. Welcome to the channel, mate. Thanks, Noah. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, it is exciting and the EV metal space is just sort of waking up. People have been incredibly fortunate when it comes to if they were investing in, in the lithium space up to date over the last couple of years, you've seen the lithium price go well, almost parabolic from where it was in 2017. Um, and clearly nickel and cobalt is another chapter to that. Um, and yeah, we've discovered a billion tons of 0 0.3 nickel equivalent in the heart of Canada. So it's exciting. It's a great find. Before we talk about the discovery itself, because there's a lot to unpack there, did you want to give the overview about who Aston Minerals is and what you've actually got your hands on across the board there? Um, Aston Minerals started off as a basically a shell. We were looking for cobalt in Slovakia. Um, we found cobalt, but then the cobalt price fell out of bed and we, um, we effectively went to hibernation. In 2019 and 20, we were looking for other assets. We um, originally picked up this asset in just south of Timmins in Canada, in Ontario. And we bought it for a um, bought it for a gold project originally. And um, there is gold there. So we've got, we've been delineated a million and a half ounces of gold. And that story is kind of not dead yet. That's just emerging. But um, whilst we were drilling for the gold, we went through about 150 meters of disseminated sulfides in one of our hole, holes that were searching for gold. And um, we thought, you know, there must be potentially gold in this hole. Um, came back, there wasn't any gold in the core, there was actually a nickel. So all of a sudden we're like, wait a sec, what's going on? We really need to understand this. And um, we, about 18 months ago, we started drilling nickel holes and we've now, you know, we spent the last 18 months and we've now delineated a billion tons at 0.3 nickel equivalent. So we've got about, um, about somewhere between eight and 10% of that 0.3 is actually cobalt. So there's also cobalt in the system, which is again, um, utilized in the lithium ion battery if you can for investors who aren't familiar with it this is one of the largest nickel sulfide deposits in the world can you give an idea about the scale of just how large this thing actually is um so we've delineated a billion tons now to give some context it's that that is massive like it's about 2.8 million tons of nickel metal is contained in that um in that deposit Plus, also, there's a large portion, about 120,000 tons, 115,000 tons of, of cobalt. Um, when you put into context, and the, the project that we effectively compared this to early on is an asset called Mount Keith in Australia. Mount Keith is owned by, um, by BHP. It's been in operation for, I think, about 60 years now. So it's, it's a, an, an asset that's been in production for quite some time. It is, a, uh, I think, it's still 200 million tons at 0.5% um, nickel. However, Mount Keith has about 50% of that, that ore body in silicates. So when it's in silicates, the nickel is a bit more difficult to recover. They actually can't recover it. Um, and so that brings that down to about 0.25% of recoverable nickel. So when we're looking to compare it to a certain asset, that is the one that we compare it to. It sits inside BHP. It's been the largest producer of nickel sulfide in Australia for, for decades. And then just talking about some of the benefits from your project itself, a few interesting ones. It's relatively close to surface. Obviously, the strategic importance right in North America. You've got that hydroelectric power running through. Can you list those off for the investors? Um, so the other asset that you could probably look at and do a comparison to is a company called, was well, inside it's inside Oz Minerals. It's called West Musgrave. Um, West Musgrave is a 390 million ton deposit at 0.31 nickel. So similar grade to ours. It also has a cobalt credit. I'm sorry, a copper credit. Um, but that project is about a thousand kilometers from anywhere. They need to build a 
wind farm, solar farm, battery farm, diesel generation, a bit of airport and camp and all that sort of stuff. This asset sits effectively in Canada's mining mecca. It's um, it's just south of a, of a town called Timmins. And Timmins had 70 plus million ounces of gold. Um, if you look at, there's a project called Cote, which is owned by IM Gold. It's a gold deposit. It's only uh, 40, 50 kilometers west of us. And that's 20 million ounces at 0.8 grams. Um, and that's a large open cut deposit, which is um, what, our, what we're talking about here. They mine 60 plus million tons a year there, where this this deposit, so there's precedent for projects in this region. But um, most importantly, you know, it's first world jurisdiction and that's great. It's got hydropower, so it's clean. So it's not like the nickel that comes from Indonesia where they're burning a lot of coal and powering it through that, um, that process with fossil fuels. So there's those two options. One of the key attributes though, sitting in North America, especially with the Inflation Act, with all the geopolitical issues that are going on in the world. Um, you know, the largest producing nickel sulfide deposit is actually in Russia. Um, it does about 200,000 tonnes of nickel metal a year. It's it's a, a ginormous asset. Um, so having a world-class, like a tier one scale asset sitting in North America, especially with what's going on in the world and the demand for electric vehicles, um, this is basically right to be taken advantage of. So yeah, that's that's probably the, the most exciting attribute of it. It is open cut, it's big, it's wide, it's uh, it's gonna be a large um, pit at some point. So it's um, it has all the right attributes. There's the evidence strategic importance. Just talking a little bit about the grades, you know, if we think about the spectrums, obviously you've got uh, the low grade and then high volume and then the higher grade with the lower volume. Obviously this sits on the lower grade side of it. Can you talk about that and kind of the importance it plays within the ecosystem? Um, well, it comes back to the to the scale. So a lot of these deposits that we discover and we consider you know, interesting and exciting is uh, typically can be high grade. Um, but I use a very simple analogy. I've been doing this when I've been talking to investors. Now, using copper as an example, um, you know, you've got Sandfires de Grassa, which was, you know, four or 5% um, copper ore body, but it was small. And now it's, I think it's almost finished or finishing. Um, then you've got something like Escondida, which is massive, but probably 0 0.3, 0 0.4 copper. So it's the grades have dropped off significantly lower. However, that's got almost an infinite. Um, resource base and it's going to be continuing and continuing forever um, from the looks of it. So this is what we have. We don't have a very high grade deposit. Ours is a very large, low grade disseminated ore body. Um, we're very fortunate because it is extremely wide. So our strip ratio is going to be negligible. Um, the width of this deposit in some areas, it goes from two to 300 meters up to almost up to six, 700 meters wide. So the strip ratio is negligible. Um, and it comes down to, to volume processed. So for us, I mean, I can't talk about production profiles because we haven't done a study and we haven't gone through that process, but you know, it's, it's really in terms of the amount of tons processed, if you have a billion tons and you tried to finish it in like 40 years, got a very large scale operation there. Um, so you can do the back of the envelope calculations yourself. It's, it's, it's not hard to do as to what this cost per ton. In fact, if you go and look at this, the um, the study that we have, the, the um, Jork Resource announcement, in um, in the actual tables, it talks about the, the competent person and the consulting, the engineer, independent engineers. They actually put together a model of what it should cost to mine it, should process it, the G&A costs and the cost to sell of the product. Um, so you can do a back of the envelope as to what that's, um, what it should cost us. So, yeah. Fantastic. So you've got the maiden resource there. Obviously, it's a major milestone. Still more drilling. You'll continue looking away on that front, but I'm sure there's some thinking as well about commercialization, development. What are you thinking about at the moment at Aston Minerals and what's up next? So we've got two options. We um obviously once you define one of the world's largest nickel, sulfide nickel oil bodies, you have a lot of corporates that have expressed interest. So we're going down that path and exploring um all the different potentials. So there'll be groups doing due diligence and going through the process with us. Um, you know, at the the scale this is, everyone has to have an opinion. So everyone has to have had looked at it. Um, or 
my preferred route. And I mean, again, it depends on what we got offered. So I'll say my preferred route for the time being until we start this process. I mean, we just got our resource uh, a few days ago. So the the groups that are coming to us sort of, you know, coming with, a, with an open eye. Um, but we've also got the potential to build a team. So there are groups out there that have built and developed assets previously um, that have skill set in these large disseminated nickel ore bodies that would be ideal for taking this forward. Now, there are groups that I'm talking to, so it's it's not like it's something that's in the that's it's not in the background. This is actually at the forefront. It's one of the key things that we um to to take this forward. Our current team of Rob Juson and Dale, they're um they're effectively geologists. And a lot of the geological work is kind of done at this point. It now goes into engineers, the COO, operations, development, um, putting the studies together. So it's a different skill set. So you'd expect people to change and the teams to change. However, one of the key attributes of this, and I go back to my to the first point that you you made, is where this sits in the world. Now, there aren't any deposits of this scale that I know of anywhere in the world that are actually pure nickel sulfide. People have silicate hosted and alloy hosted nickel deposits, and that's different. However, this is sulfide. Now, it's simple processing. It's crush, grind, rough art, three stages of flotation, and then concentrate and sell. So that's that's the first part. It's a simple process. Secondly is where it sits in North America with the electric vehicle boom that's going on right now and the growth that we're seeing, the trajectory we're seeing, Tesla has its offtake for its nickel from Vale. GM has got 25,000 ton offtake from Vale. So their capacity is effectively extinguished. Then you have Volkswagen, BMW, Toyota, go through the list of the Koreans all looking to produce batteries and electric cars in the United States. Now, they actually need an asset like this developed to be able to source that material. Now, everyone goes to me, oh, but the CapEx is going to be large. I'm like, yes, it is going to be large. It's not a small project. We're talking about something that's globally significant. We're not talking about, um, you know, we're building a 100, 150 million, you know, five to 10,000 or 20,000 ton nickel producer. We're talking about something that has a scale to service all of those companies potentially. So going back to the US government and Biden's Inflation Act and the $500 billion they've set aside, this project um, is going to be perfectly placed to be able to access those funds because it does resolve a solution, not just for electric vehicles and the you know basically the commodity race that's going on to secure those minerals, but also geopolitically not having to rely on Russian class one nickel sulfide. So thinking about all of that, obviously we've talked about the corporate support from that side. Is it uh, lucky that investors couldn't think about some of those discussions potentially at the government level? We obviously know about the Inflation Reduction Act, obviously the Canadian critical mineral strategy as well. Are these some of those discussions slowly starting to emerge? Yeah, so PDAC, there's a conference in a week from now or two weeks from now. And um, we'll be there speaking to all of them and all the corporates. So I'm going a week earlier and actually sitting down with every single one of those groups that's interested in, in potentially partnering or acquiring the asset. And I'm... Um, so we'll go through that process. Um, and also the team that I was talking about, going through the process with them as well to understand how we fit and it works. Um, but yeah, the it's literally the meeting of the, the government agencies and understanding for them to understand what the potential is here. Um, and again, there's nothing else like this in North America. There are smaller vein assets that, you know, again, smaller production, they're not going to be able to meet the demands that are actually there. And you'll appreciate this. And this is where the arbitrage and the opportunity comes in. It's probably why your listeners are listening. It's it's not easy to find these minerals in concentrations in at scale to be able to service the demand that's coming. I mean, it's it's easy to design and build an electric uh, lithium ion battery plant. That's that's one thing. But building a mine that's going to service another three gigafactories, that's not easy. And to discover those deposits, that's even more difficult. 
I did want to ask you about that. Obviously, we've seen the supply pressures really starting to ramp up across the EV battery materials there. But what's that outlook that you've got for nickel and what do you think about it looks like over the next decade? Yeah, I wouldn't want to be short it. That's for sure. Um, well, it's the same same thematic for lithium, the same thematic for graphite, same graphic cobalt, anything that's going into that, that supply chain. And um, I'll go back to the, my, my point that I just made. You know, these entrepreneurs, they're building these massive gigafactories. LG, go through the list, Panasonic, Tesla. Now you've got Volkswagen and all the car companies saying we're moving in that direction. Government saying you've got to we're completely stopping um, the ICE car production and sales from 2030 and 35 and 40. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think it's going to be difficult to do that. But even if they half right, let's say a quarter right, then the demand for these minerals, I actually just, don't, I personally do not know where it's all going to come from. I mean, you need you need that many new mines. And I've built mines before. Like I, I, I was a guy that put SARA together. I found a deposit, raised all the funds. It's difficult getting engineering, permitting, environmental, social requirements, going through the actual feasibility, the construction, putting a management team in that can actually develop and deliver. It's, it's not an easy feat and you need specialist skills and once you've tapped those special skills for a couple of projects, I don't know where the rest of them are going to come from. Like, how do you do all of them at once? And this is this is one thing that people don't look at or understand is the the knowledge base that's required to build a mine. That's that's finite, um, and the capital we well, actually go have to go and compete for it as well. So there are so many things that that are re required in building the supply chain out, and some um, I think people sometimes underestimate. The, the schedules and the skills required. It's easier to build an electric, um, a lithium ion battery plant because you know what you need. You put your orders in, you put it together. It's it's not that difficult. But when you're going through and permitting a, a large scale lithium, nickel, cobalt, graphite, copper, whatever mine it is, it's it's not just not that easy. It's evidently the tailwinds are there for the industry at large. What are investors looking for over this next period for Aston Minerals? What are those key catalysts that you think are likely to come up over the horizon? Well, the, there's a couple of key ones. It's, um, one thing we haven't tapped on, touched on is actually the gold. So our gold deposits, one and a half million ounces at a gram. And um, if you go and have a look at actually the actual deposit and the release that we put out uh, about a month ago, there's this area we call Sorolla. And Sorolla is... Um, we were drilling, effectively drilling blind there because it was taking like three, six, nine months to get drill results. Back in 2021, we were focused on it, 20, early 22. And um, we could see visible gold in the in the core in multiple in zones. And when we finally got the results back, we realized there's almost 10 or 11 separate loads um, within a three to 400 meter um, space or width. And our easternmost holes hit multiple loads of gold as well and that looks like the ip chargeability normally which is what we we're chasing um it looks like it goes another four to five kilometers to the um to the east so we're going to put some large spaced wide spaced holes along that to see if it actually does because that could be incredibly exciting and um we are in large gold country so that, that's one thing to put aside. And again, that's that's Mother Nature. If it comes in, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's, it is what it is. Um, but the main game is still the nickel. So in terms of what we're doing there is we're going to talk to all the corporates to see what interest they have. Um, and the main driver for me there is not really the funding. It's more to do with the fact that do have they have the team and the capability and what kind of deal can we put together to, to make it most valuable for um, Aston shareholders. Second, but more importantly, and this is the phase that I'm more uh, focused on, this is where I'd prefer to go down unless something significant happens, is um, putting the team together. So new CEO, new management team, COO, CFO, geologist, metallurgist, putting the whole team that actually um, can build a deposit. And I've done this before in a couple of different companies, but um, the same thing happened when I was building SARA. The geological team that started the company and discovered the project as a natural evolution um and if they eventually move on from the business and you bring in the different skill set to actually bring it to fruition um and it's at that point you get to actually understand the economics because those guys 
can genuinely deliver the economics and they've built and operated mines before. So that's probably the biggest catalyst that I see coming. And if we get the right team, then the potential for this project to deliver um, the tons that North America require and the likes of Elon and Ford and all the other groups that are looking for this material mineral, um, both nickel and cobalt can uh, can rely on. And that's when the, the large funding phase comes into it. You talked about it just then. You have done this before. Lessons learned from your experience at Syra and the other companies you've been involved with. What are they and kind of how is it going to help you circumvent kind of this experience here? Oh, very, very different beast. With Syra, I was dealing with Mozambique, which is a completely different jurisdiction with all sorts of new legislation, its infancy and its mining sector. Um, working with hand in hand with the mines department and the environmental department and the ESG concerns and dealing with locals that effectively don't have water and power and everything. So it's it's a very different beast. This is first world jurisdiction. There's a hydropower line going straight past the deposit. So we're not running on diesel. It's clean air electricity. Um, the workforce, I suspect, could almost go home every day. Like if we're 40 kilometers south of Timmins, which is basically a mining hub of um, Ontario, Canada. So there's multiple large gold companies there. So that, that's that's um, something that makes it a hell of a lot easier to manage. Um, it's also not just that, it's also the construction skills and talents in that part of the world. See, with Mozambique, when I was in Africa, you're flying everything in, you're flying everyone in. Um, so the logistics is a hell of a lot more complicated. Um, again, time pressures, cost pressures, education pressures, that you have there in in Canada, Ontario, this is that's they're, they're not issues. I mean, 200k south of us is two large smelters. One's owned by Vale, and one by uh, Glencore. So two large nickel uh, smelters. That's 200 kilometers south. Sudbury, which is the town, has, been, I think, it was a produced 50 percent of the world's nickel for almost a hundred years. So the skill set that's um, sitting in this part of the world is pretty significant. So there, there are some things that are actually um, that are managed just just because of the location. However, the other the other main aspect is graphite is is not just one commodity; it's an industrial mineral, and it has you know fifty different applications. So you're talking when you're when you're doing offtakes and deals and stuff, you're you're talking to all sorts of different industries. Here, this project, the reason why we're doing it, and don't get me wrong, I specifically had tesla and electric vehicles in mind when i was when i was working at sara that was it that was the main game however we had other markets to sell to here at um at aston at edelson um we've literally just got all we want to produce is nickel and cobalt for batteries that's it that is the plan it's literally going to be designed and um, managed to to fulfill that huge impending demand otherwise um again i wouldn't do it but that's 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 why we're here for those investors who have followed the Aston Minerals story, or maybe those who are now just learning about Aston Minerals after this announcement, any final reflections that you had for them? Um, it's evolving. It's going to be exciting. It is huge. So it's got incredible scale. Um, it is lower grade, but again, when you, when you produce something on mass, um, the, the potential mine life on something of this scale is is large. Um, and the demand that, that's coming for nickel and cobalt, it's the only asset that I can see anywhere of that sort, kind of scale that can actually satisfy it. I mean, there's lots of steps that we have to go through to get there. Um, and it's not, uh, not a simple process. Like it's going to take time and effort and, you know, there's all sorts of risks involved, but um, there's so many of these risks that are typically in projects that are mitigated already just by the fact of where it is and what it is. That's the Aston Mineral story. It's ASX ASO. Tolga Komovo, mate, I really enjoyed that conversation. Looking forward to seeing what's up ahead. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Noah. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody.